Hi, my name is Bartosz. I'm with uh, Belibre, a French-based uh, embedded Linux consultancy. And today I'll be talking about why so many Linux plumbing layer components end up having multiple incompatible major versions and what can we do to avoid it. I'll be mostly talking about uh, very specific things that make kernel or user space library interfaces impossible to improve uh, without breaking uh, compatibility contracts in general, what uh, mistakes one should try to avoid uh, in order to keep uh, libraries, APIs in general, extendable in the future. Uh, Belibre is a uh, not so small now. Uh, we are around uh, 50 people. Um, we, uh, we are a Linux uh, consultancy based in southern France. We help clients launch hardware and software products uh, and we help them uh, through, uh, through the entire process from concept to manufacturing. We work uh, with the Linux community extensively. We upstream support for uh, several hardware platforms uh, and we are the founding members of the Kernel CI project. Personally, I have uh, 12 years of experience now. Uh, I work all across the stack, the stack uh, from kernel space uh, and even uh, bare metal and bootloaders. RTOSs uh, up to uh, low-level user space and uh, Linux build tools uh, like Buildroot or Yocto. I am the author and maintainer of uh, libgpid and co-maintainer of the GPIO kernel subsystem and uh, I also contribute a lot to different uh, open source projects uh, including Yocto. Um, so this talk is based on uh, lessons learned while working on two open source components. Uh, the GPIO character device exposed by Linux for every GPIO chip since uh, 4.6 I think. and the user space library and tools that we provide in order to wrap the kernel interfaces in an elegant and uh, easy to use way. A bit of uh, history first. The GPIO character device has been introduced in the kernel as a replacement for the deprecated sysfs interface uh, and libgpid was released in order to provide a C interface that is easier to use than raw Linux ioctl calls and that would be the base for the command line tools that could be used in scripts with the idea that this would make it easier for people used to sysfs to switch to character device. And if you look at the UIP, UAPI header for the GPIO character device today, uh, you'll see that the number of symbols is marked as GPIO v2, uh, GPIO underscore v2. And if you look at the mainline Git repository for libgpiod at kernel.org, you'll notice that there is a branch called next slash uh, libgpiod v2 and that it is under active development at the moment. So what exactly happened? Why are we creating a new backward incompatible interface for GPIO only four years after the first one was released? So before I tell you, uh, I'd like to discuss what different types of compatibility we are exposed to in Linux. Some of those things I described may be obvious to many folks, but there are unexpected caveats when it comes to binary compatibility that even experienced Linux hackers find surprising, especially if you venture beyond C and go into the realm of C++ or Rust. And there are also a lot of kernel developers who rarely venture into the user land where issues of compatibility are uh, more pronounced uh, than what you deal in uh, deal with in the kernel. That is, in the kernel, it's, it's quite uh, simple. There's no stability of in-kernel interfaces and uh, indefinite stability of uh, kernel user space interfaces, but this is actually a bit more complicated than, than that in user space. Um, so let's take libgpid as an example. libgpid talks to the kernel using uh, ioctl system calls, passing around a set of structures defined in the relevant uh, user API, uh, in, the, in, in the relevant user uh, API of, of the exposed by the kernel. And on the other side, it exposes a C header containing a bunch of symbols and a shared, shared library called libgpid. Uh, on top of that, uh, we've built the C++ and Python bindings, and uh, well, Python bindings are written in C, and uh, C++ bindings are written in well, C++. So the important thing to note is that the C++ bindings expose another shared library called uh, libgpid CXX uh, to make things complicated. But this is all pretty normal stuff. Most system level components are written in C and compiled as shared libraries and expose C headers to interface with uh, the library. 
And while the C standard does not define any ABI standard, Linux has a de facto standardized ABI. Um, so we're now concerned with two types of compatibility, uh, source or API and binary or uh, ABI. The general definitions of the two are simple. For the former, two versions are compatible, uh, two, two, two versions of a uh, library are source compatible if any program using the exposed symbols can be recompiled with both without updating its source. Uh, and for the latter, it's a bit stricter. A program linked against the library is guaranteed to work with both versions without rebuilding the program for the versions uh, to be ABI compatible. And uh, so it's, it's true, it truly is like both API and ABI it truly are just contracts. Um, and uh, this contract can be honored, extended or broken between versions. Uh, and when considering the differences between two versions, we can have three situations, both for API as well as ABI compatibility. So we can go from uh, A to B or uh, one to two without any change in the interface. For example, the only thing that changed is uh, some internal implementation details. Uh, and we can go from A to B uh, and add new interfaces. For example, we add a new function uh, that makes A compatible with B. So a program using A uh, will work with B, but programs using B are not guaranteed to work with A. And finally, we can go from A to B and remove a certain function or replace it with a different one or change the arguments or modify a visible structure or change uh, in values. Uh, and in that case, programs, uh, we, we, break, we break all, in that case, we break all compatibility and programs using A will not work with B and vice versa. So API and ABI compatibility are independent from each other and one can be broken without affecting the other. Um, for instance, if you extend the size of a struct but don't change its previous layout or rename the numbers, uh, you do break the ABI, but you will still be source compatible. If you, on the other, on the other hand, rename some preprocessor defines in the header but keep the old values or rename enums but uh, keep the old values, you, you do break the source compatibility but not the ABI because a program linked against uh, two versions with, with two versions of libraries uh, built with different symbol names uh, that retain the values will work. Um, and so uh, back to the GPIOD and the character device. Uh, when the first version of the character device and subsequently the first version of libgpiod was released. It supported a set of features that we wanted to expose to the user space because obviously we knew what should be available to user land and which GPIO features should remain uh, confined uh, to the kernel. Uh, except that those SQ users started coming up with uh, annoyingly valid reasons for extending the interface with features that we didn't plan for. And then we face the reality uh, of our interfaces, both in the kernel as well as uh, in libgpiod being badly designed on, on several levels. So example, in the structure passed between the kernel and the user space, uh, we left no reserved space for future use. While we could potentially um, add new flags, uh, like new values uh, for, for the flags, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be enough because users at some point started asking us to add, for instance, the debounce period setting. Because uh, what is reading line interrupts in user space good for if you can't set up the debouncing? Um, another request for line events uh, was sequence numbers because what good is uh, bit banging implementation in user space if you need that, if you can't assure the right ordering of uh, events in the queue? So already we are in a situation. We were in a situation where we could introduce new feature. We, we could not introduce new features to the interface that would not uh, break the ABI contract. But we, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we were in the situation where we uh, could introduce new features to the interface. Uh, but that would, uh, but we, we basically locked ourselves out of that possibility because we didn't uh, think about it in advance and we didn't simply leave any reserve space. So this is the lesson one that we learned. Always add reserve space to your exposed uh, structures. It costs very little unless you go above, I don't know, the, the, the memory page boundary. Uh, it, it, unless you 
do that, it doesn't really cost anything and it allows you to extend your interfaces in the future without breaking the contract, uh, especially when designing uh, iOctals, because in user space, we, could, we can do a better thing that I'll discuss in a minute. But uh, lesson one learned in libgpiod, when, uh, sorry, in, in the GPIO character device interface, when uh, we designed it, we left uh, some, 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 uh, some padding so that, well, right now it seems as if uh, we are done, that the, the, the API is complete. We really don't want to expose any, any new features, but I have a feeling that uh, someone at some point will come up with an idea that uh, we will uh, agree to implement. And for that, we're already uh, prepared. Every structure that we are exposing in the V2 um, interface has already some padding. We, were, we should be good for most part. So lesson two is related to, uh, to, the, to the problem described before. As you could see, we have, uh, so in, if you look in the, into the header for libgpiod, you're gonna notice that we have the same problem. Several structures uh, are exposed as in, as in their, their, their layout is defined in the header. That means that the user can allocate the structure on the stack and uh, their layout is exposed. They are exposed because uh, at the time, uh, this was my first serious library that I was designing, I didn't know any better. Um, and I feared that making certain structures opaque would uh, impose a penalty if they were allocated uh, on the heap exclusively, like for, like for instance, the, the, the mentioned uh, line event structures. Uh, they normally would need to be created a lot because uh, there can be a lot of line events coming up uh, in the queue. Uh, and other concern was that they, uh, that if I made uh, certain structures opaque, they would be very complicated to use with C accessors. And uh, in, in this case, I'm talking mostly about the config structure that is used to set up a, a line request, a GPL line request before translated it, translating it into the kernel um, version and, and, and passing it over by, o o over the, the IOTL code. So I settled on having certain structures visible to the user. Uh, and of course, this was a bad idea. In fact, it's a well-known pattern in low-level Linux libraries to make all objects opaque. Uh, and this really is the right approach uh, as not making any guarantees to the users uh, about the layout of, uh, or, or the size of structures uh, saves us all, the, uh, all kinds of problems with the ABI. But what if you know that certain structures will be allocated a lot and you don't want to impact the performance by calling into the allocator all the time? So one of the ideas, and, and this is what we used in libgpiod, is using uh, opaque containers. Uh, so uh, we have a container object that is allocated on the heap. And then when we, uh, and, and it stores uh, static, like statically, it, 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 it stores already pre-allocated structures that we can reuse uh, all the time and, and they are not being reallocated uh, again. So lesson learned, so this is uh, maybe a, a, an example that, uh, that gives you an idea of what we did. So before, above, uh, this is what we had. We had um, a user who wanted to create a buffer for line events, needed to allocate it on the, or could allocate it on the, on the stack and then simply call a function that would uh, read the events and try to translate the, them from the kernel form into the user space form and put them in, store them into, into this uh, visible buffer. So what we do now is that the user now has to allocate a, a, an edge event buffer uh, and then read events into that buffer. And then th this is the only time that we actually allocate uh, anything uh, here. And then when the events are, um, are read, they are stored in this buffer, and the user can actually get uh, handles to the opaque event structures uh, and act on them without uh, reallocating them all the time. So this is obviously an improvement. But what about other languages? So we also support uh, Python and C++. Uh, for, Py for Python, it's clear, Python doesn't have uh, ABI. Uh, and also in Python, every object is allocated on the heap, so this, this is uh, not really a concern here. But uh, in C++, the class layout is visible. And uh, in this case, we just went with the pimple um, idiom, so that classes look like this. They expose uh, only their methods and uh, use a 
uh, a smart pointer to store uh, a pointer to the implementation class, which is all, which is actually hidden. So, yeah, the 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 the, the class, the public part of the class, only contains a smart pointer, and uh, the implementation itself is hidden from from the from the user. And uh, what we do for edge events in this case, because we want to replicate this uh, very efficient way of uh, allocating the event buffer, uh, we actually used uh, a a bit of uh, uh, polymorphism where uh, the the edge event classes that are stored in the buffer are not managed, but as soon as the user copies them, as long as the user just reads their values that that, that that's fine, they're not being copied, but as soon as the user copies them, then they become managed with, uh, with a smart pointer. So it's uh, just a, a, a nice trick to, to have something efficient, uh, replicate its efficient behavior in C++. So lesson three, uh, make sure your expo exposed structures work on 32 and 64 bit architectures. So this, uh, I'm adding the asterisk here because while for most part you don't need to be concerned about the layout of structures, as long as you're not sending them over the wire when you're defining them. Uh, but uh, even then, you, well, if, if you're sending them over, over the wire, you should probably not really do it yourself. You should use some standard way of marshalling the data. But in general, when you're defining a structure, you're not really uh, concerned with padding, with alignment, and all that. This is done by the compiler, uh, except when oh. okay. Uh, except yeah. So, except in uh, certain surprising. Um, circumstances. So let's take a look at this structure. So what is wrong with that? Uh, so the, it, it only has two fields. Uh, and this is the structure exposed uh, by the version one of the kernel interface for the GPIO character device. This is the event data that would be actually read by the GPIOD from the kernel. So what is wrong with it? Uh, at first sight, nothing is wrong with it. Uh, on 32-bit architectures, uh, the struct will be aligned to 32 bits, and this it will look just like this. And on 64-bit uh, architectures, there would be additional padding added, uh, so that the struct structure would be aligned to 64 bits. And this isn't a problem if your kernel is 64 bits and the user space is 60, uh, 64 bits, but we also need to support uh, Linux. That Linux does support compatibility mode for 32-bit uh, user space. That the kernel is 64 bits and the user space is compiled in uh, as, as, as 32 bits. So we actually uh, encountered this situation where we would send events from 64-bit kernel to 32-bit uh, user space and the user space would be completely confused because uh, the kernel would send structures that would be 128 bits in size and it wouldn't expect it, it would expect uh, 96 uh, bits. So uh, how do you fix that? Well, again, just make sure that you pad your structure to the correct size, especially if, if this is the structure that is exposed by the kernel. Uh, you have to think about the compatibility mode. Uh, for v2, we made sure that all our structures, uh, especially those that can be retrieved with the read system call, uh, be correctly padded and work with, uh, with this specific compatibility case. Uh, next lesson. Some surprising details can break the ABI. Uh, so it turns out that the structure layout is not the only thing that's considered to be part of the contract between the kernel and the user space. Uh, so everyone knows uh, one of the most famous Linux runs about how we must not suddenly change the error codes returned to user space. Uh, in hands hindsight, this is a no-brainer. However, we had a uh, quite a similar situation over uh, at the GPIO subsystem. So the clock that we used to timestamp the line events in the kernel that would be then exported to user space uh, was the real-time clock. At some point, it was determined that it uh, 
it's, it's obvious that a real clock is not uh, real time clock is not uh, is not uh, guaranteed to not go back or to move back and forth in time um, and that it wouldn't really so users notice that we don't really convey the right information to the user space about the timestamps of the events or approximate uh, moment in time when, when the events would uh, occur. So we decided to change it to the monotonic clock. Um, and soon after we had a user complain about the change because they actually relied on the timestamps being derived from the real time clock. Fortunately, the user adjusted their code and didn't require us to go back. Uh, but if they insisted, obviously we would need to keep uh, the, the interface stable and we would have to revert that change. So fortunately, we are still, uh, we still have, uh, we retain the, the monotonic clock. But what we did for version two, we simply added a, a switch so that the user can, can decide for themselves what clock they want to use. So right now we support the monotonic clock uh, for event timestamps, uh, real time clock. And also we have an upcoming support for, uh, for the hardware timestamping engine. In, it's, it's, it's a new general thing in uh, feature in, in the Linux kernel, but we will support it in GPIO for uh, our event timestamps. So lesson five, um, don't try to keep the user space data models the same as the one in the kernel. So the goal of user space uh, libraries working close to the kernel is to represent whatever the abstract data model kernel uses uh, in a way best suited to user land. And oftentimes the kernel representation is quite specific to the problems faced inside the kernel. Uh, the problems may be different in user space and also user space accesses the data structures in a different way. So as tempting as it may be to stick to, the, to a similar representation, it's often better to uh, spend some time on designing a bespoke model of, of, of the data structures for, for the user space. So what you see here is the representation of the GPIOs in the kernel. So every chip, like we have an example chip that has uh, exports eight lines. Uh, and what drivers do in the kernel, they, they call GPIOD get. Uh, and they receive a GPIO descriptor, which is a pointer to a structure uh, defined in, in the libgpio decode. And also users can, uh, can call a, a, a var var variant of this function called GPIOD get array and receive an, uh, a container for multiple descriptors. So what happens now is that the GPIOD get function actually does request the line so that the lines become uh, Owned, their ownership is passed to the using driver and then nobody else can, uh, can request them. Uh, so so this, is, this is what we do in the kernel. And what I thought would be best for version one of libgpod would be to simply uh, follow that model. Except that uh, there is a, a, a slight change. Uh, so we, have st we still have a chip and this is the chip that we open with gpiod chip open. Unlike the kernel, the, 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 in, in the kernel, the users don't really need to open a chip. But uh, in, in this case, we are opening a, a character device, so we have another layer. And then uh, a user can call a function called GPIOD chip get line to retrieve uh, an opaque uh, pointer to, to the line object. And every line object represents a line. And now this line is not yet requested. This is unlike what the kernel does. This line is not yet requested. Uh, right now, we only have a handle that allows us to read information about the line. So, so we, we can use, we, we can read uh, its state, its uh, direction, its uh, various flags. And we also can retrieve multiple lines uh, and then that they are stored in, in an object that we call the GPIOD line bulk. Uh, and the same, they are still not requested. So now, only now, the user can call the request function, GPIOD uh, line request or request lines. Uh, and only then they become owned by the user space process. So uh, what is wrong with this? So the thing about the line information that can be retrieved from the GPIOD line uh, object is that it's, uh, when, when, the, when the user space reads it from the kernel, it's, it really is only a snapshot. So we, uh, when, when, when you read a, a single 
flag of the line, um, a single setting of the line, uh, you're, it's not guaranteed to retain it, it, this value uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in any time in the future. So this is a problem because uh, there is, so until, uh, w w while we do have a, a certain way of notifying the user space about uh, changes in status of lines, uh, it's not very obvious from the API of the library. Uh, and, and you would have to, un, un, unless you set up an event loop, if you just have a very simple program, you would have to reread re the status of the lines manually. So we decided for version two to have a completely different model of, uh, of the, like a completely different data, data structure model. So we still have a chip. We still open it with GPIOD chip open. But uh, what happens now? Uh, there is, there no longer exists a, a, uh, in a, a class of objects that would represent lines. What we have instead is we have objects called uh, GPIOD line info, and it's very explicit that they don't contain up-to-date info, that they contain a snapshot on, of information retrieved at the time when the call was made to GPIOD chip get line info. So this is how, this is, uh, this is an improvement over, over the previous version because right now it's very clear that uh, all the settings that the user can, re all, all, all the flags that, uh, or, or various values uh, that the user can read from this line info object uh, are only a snapshot in time. And uh, every time, so we, we still have the mechanism to inform users about changes in, in the status, but right now they, are, they, 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 they receive, every time a status occurs, they can read a new line info structure with up-to-date information. Um, so yeah, this, this, this is how it works right now uh, for the line info. And also uh, the requests, line requests are made in a different way. So we are no longer operating on separate lines because it no longer makes any sense we request entire sets of lines. So we have a uh, function called GPID chip request lines. Uh, it takes, as, as, as argument, it takes a, like an elaborate config structure, but uh, right now we have, uh, we, we, act like we, we do the request for a set of offsets. It can be a single line, but uh, we're on, never operating on, on uh, single lines. We are, we're always doing uh, requests for multiple, multiple lines at once. Uh, and this uh, allows us to, so uh, now the, the lifetime of the GPID line request object is uh, detached from, uh, from the chip. So the chip can be closed and the request can be uh, kept because it's actually associated with a different file descriptor. Uh, so this is, this is an idea uh, on how we completely detached our user space data model from the one in the kernel. Uh, so I, I encourage everyone to just uh, try to give it a, a try and not to follow uh, the kernel data structure uh, model to the letter. And so the things I uh, described here um, are very specific to our uh, project. Um, I, I, I hope they're, they, they're, they're useful, but they're pretty specific to, to this very, uh, this very, very uh, uh, narrow set of uh, interfaces. But there is um, this project that I, I, I actually, I, I, uh, I sadly learned about it uh, after I designed and released the, the, the first version of libgpiod. But it actually, uh, the, the, I'm, I'm talking about the libabc project, which is a, um, a dummy library that simply shows uh, the good practices of uh, designing user space libraries for the plumbing layer in Linux. Uh, so it contains uh, some things about which I, which I spoke, so that the, 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 the all data structures exposed by the library should be opaque and should be accessed with dedicated functions, uh, that there should be no global state um, in a library because this way it can be made not, not thread safe, but thread aware, etc., uh, etc. Et so this is a good read. Uh, I, I posted the links to it uh, here. And uh, that's it for the presentation. Uh, I'm open to discussion. Thank you very much. I hope this was uh, useful. Uh, the things I, I spoke about here are actually uh, something that I learned the hard way.
Um, and I really hope that the second version of libgpid, once we release it, uh, will be at least resistant to uh, needing to have uh, another incompatible version in the future. Uh, thank you.